We're continuing our studies in Chapter 3, From Genes to Proteins, and our subject for this lesson is to consider the factors that relate to melting DNA. This refers to the separation of the two strands of the double helix so that we would be breaking the hydrogen bonding contacts as well as the base stacking interactions. Note, we are breaking intramolecular bonds, not intramolecular covalent bonds. This is also referred to as denaturation, and in this case, the thermal energy we've applied has overcome the intermolecular bond energy of the molecule. We well, find if we look at the content of DNA, that DNA that contains more AT base pairs separates more readily than those that contain more GC base pairs. It's tempting in this case to consider that it's due primarily to the hydrogen bonds. AT base pairs form two hydrogen bonds and GC base pairs form three hydrogen bonds. But remember, the stability has more to do with the base stacking differences. So if you look at the energy contained in a GC-GC base stacking arrangement, that represents about 61 kilojoules per mole. Whereas if we base stack AT-AT base pairs, that's a little bit less than half. So then the GC content of a DNA molecule relates directly to its melting temperature. In this table from your book at the top of the screen, you can see sources of DNA from different organisms and the GC content in terms of percent and the associated melting temperatures. What we find as the GC content increases down the table so does the melting temperature. And so this becomes a good measure of the strength of the interaction of those DNA molecules. Now this is a comparison of identical lengths of DNA. Obviously if we have a longer DNA molecule that's going to require a higher temperature to separate than a shorter DNA molecule. So let's look more at this melting temperature. It's the temperature at which half of the DNA is melted. In our figure from the book here we have on the x-axis the temperature in Celsius increasing from left to right and our y-axis we're following the conversion of double-stranded to single-stranded by following the relative absorbance at 260 nanometers. We'll look at that in just a minute. So in the far left we have all of our DNA in double-stranded form, but as we elevate that temperature more of those molecules separate into single-stranded form and by the time we get to the top of our curve all of our DNA is single-stranded. At the midpoint of that curve that's our melting temperature, where it's half double-stranded and half single-stranded. Now perhaps you're thinking, why don't we just measure the melting temperature as the temperature at which we have all single-stranded DNA? But remember, the amount of DNA matters as well. So it's more meaningful for us to say a percentage. That is, at what temperature is half of it melted? And that most accurate point is the inflection point, that halfway point. Now how do we measure the difference between double-stranded and single-stranded? That has to do with the absorbance at 260 nanometers. Because of the resonance in the base rings, those rings absorb at 260 nanometers. They do so more strongly in single-stranded form they, than they do in double-stranded. And so as we go from double-stranded to single-stranded, our absorbance at 260 nanometers increases. Note, even in double-stranded form, it still absorbs at 260, but it's stronger if it's in the single-stranded form. And so that's how we know if we've melted the DNA successfully. In terms of renaturing the DNA, that is bringing the two strands together, we can simply lower the temperature and it reanneals. It reforms those hydrogen bonds and those bases restack. If we cool it too rapidly though, those hydrogen bonding contacts will form in a mismatched way. That's illustrated at the bottom of the figure here. Unfortunately, we've cooled the temperature to such a degree we can't separate the two strands anymore. All that's left for us to do is re-elevate that temperature, separate the two strands again, and cool it at a slower level. And then they can re-anneal more accurately. And so the annealing time will depend on the length of the DNA molecule as far as the time we need to allow for that to cool in order to form the proper hydrogen bonding contacts. 
This melting and reannealing relates to cloning processes that we'll consider shortly. In our next video lesson for Chapter 3, we'll briefly review the central dogma and see how this relates to gene expression.